uh, the Honorable Member for Edmonton, St. Albert. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure for me to rise today to speak at second reading to Bill C-42, which will further and severely restrict the availability of one of the most innovative but certainly controversial elements of our sentencing law, the conditional sentence of imprisonment. Before describing the key provisions of this bill, Mr. Speaker, please allow me to take a few moments to discuss the origin, history and rationale for, con for conditional sentencing. In June 1994, Bill C-41, Canada's first comprehensive reform and modernization of sentencing law and procedure since 1892 was introduced into this very House of Commons. Among its many elements was the creation of the conditional sentence of, of imprisonment. And what this meant, Mr. Speaker, was that for a sentence of imprisonment of less than two years, a court could and may order that it be served in the community under certain conditions and under supervision. You can only do so under the statutory conditions, such as the court being satisfied that the offender could serve the sentence in the community without endangering the population at large. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the conditional sentence was aimed at low-risk offenders sentenced to, provincial, to a provincial reformatory for a period of time of, for two years or less. When Bill C-41 was tabled, Mr. Speaker, Canada was in the midst of an unprecedented increase in the growth of prison populations, both provincially and federally. The federal inmate population, that is those serving periods of sentences of two years or more, was growing at twice the average long-term rate with a 21.5% increase in the number of federal prisoners from 1990 to 1995. During that time, Mr. Speaker, federal correctional costs exceeded $1 billion for the first time. Canada's incarceration rate of 130 prisoners per 100,000 citizens was the fourth highest in the Western world. It's quite alarming so that in the 1995 budget, the then Minister of, uh, of uh, Finance for the then Liberal government had urged federal and provincial ministers responsible for justice to develop strategies to, quote, for containing the growth of the inmate population and the associated correction costs therewith, unquote. The speech from the throne in 1996, Mr. Speaker, promised that the federal government would develop alternatives to incarceration for low-risk offenders while focusing the more expensive quote, correctional resources, unquote, on the high-risk offenders. This direction resulted in the establishment of a multi-year federal, provincial, territorial process called the Corrections Population Growth Exercise. C-41, as it was uh, introduced in, in that parliament, and the conditional sentences in particular, were seen as key to Canada's response to this significant growth in the number of prisoners. A special study of the impact of conditional sentencing on prison populations was conducted by the Canadian Centre for Justice Statistics in 2001. Mr. Speaker, in the words of a highly noted and renowned Professor Julian Roberts and Thomas Gabor of the University in Ottawa in a 2002 article in the Canadian Criminal Law Review, and the authors quoted, its results reveal that conditional sentencing has had a significant impact on the, ra on the rates of admissions to custody, which have declined by 13% since the introduction of conditional sentencing. This represents a reduction of approximately 55,000 offenders who otherwise would have been admitted into custody. In a subsequent article published in the British Journal of Criminology, Professor Rob Roberts, by this time at Oxford University, described conditional sentences as leading to the most successful decarceration exercise in the history of common law sentencing reform. So, Mr. Speaker, while the availability of conditional sentences arguably achieved the policy of restraint in the use of incarceration, it did so at considerable cost to the public faith in sentencing and the sentencing process. Controversy has surrounded the conditional sentencing re regime since its introduction. The sentence is seen by some as being too soft, a disposition for offenders who are custody bound because it is no more severe or intrusive than a, a sentence of probation. As the legislation reads, Mr. Speaker, the differences between probation and a conditional sentence are barely noticeable. The courts, moreover, may be unwilling to hand down conditional sentences in most cases because of the, that very perception that if pro probation would be an appropriate sentence, then the con conditional sentence is probably inappropriate. Some critics of conditional sentencing so go, go so far as to say 
that the stated goal of conditional sentences, which was to reduce incarceration rate, had failed due to the problems it presented to the judiciary in properly applying conditional sentences. In fact, uh, there's a series of appellate um, jurisprudence on conditional sentencing, and I'm not going to uh, talk about, uh, I'm not going to give a law lecture here today, Mr. Speaker, but I certainly Please invite do. any uh, honorable members who are interested in uh, the courts struggling with conditional sentencing sentences to read the Supreme Court of Canada's decision of 2000 in R versus Pruel. However, Mr. Speaker, conditional sentences have been appropriately used in many cases. But there have been too many examples of a failure by the courts to balance the objectives of denunciation and general deterrence with the desire to rehabilitate an offender. Due to legislation that allowed for those individuals convicted of serious offenses to receive conditional sentences, such as house arrest, judges have been handing down sentences all too frequently. This, pro this practice has caused an enormous loss of confidence in the judicial system from the public. And Mr. Speaker, we are here to serve the public, and when the public loses confidence in the administration of justice, all honorable members ought to be concerned. Here, here. The answer to this problem is to give judges, judges guidance in sentencing matters. There has been more than one legislative attempt to do so and to provide greater guidance to judges who are considering a conditional sentence. Members who have been here longer than I will recall Bill C-9 introduced by this Conservative government on May 4, 2006, and which ultimately passed on May 31, 2007. However, sadly, it did not pass unamended. This bill, as it was originally written, would have ensured that conditional sentences like house arrest would not be allowed for serious and violent crimes. However, and sadly, this bill was amended by the opposition parties in the Justice and Human Rights Committee. The amendments preserve conditional sentences for crimes such as possession of weapons for dangerous purposes, kidnapping, arson, and impaired driving causing bodily harm and death. Criminals who commit these crimes should be punished appropriately and in my view, Mr. Speaker, serve their time in prison. By restricting these crimes from conditional sentencing eligibility, Canadians will have a justice system, a justice system that imposes sentences that fit the severity of the offence, that, uh, that properly deters serious offences, and helps keep our streets safe. Mr. Speaker, with that history lesson, this brings me to Bill C-42, the bill which is under consideration before this House this afternoon, which will add new, clear provisions to the conditional sentence, uh, sentencing sections of the Criminal Code to ensure once and for all that conditional sentences are not available to individuals who commit serious, violent and serious property crimes. Good. 